Okay, good morning, everyone. Matt Braden here from the GPAR professional staff. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, as we have this last little shot of wintertime weather um, and it's windy. Unfortunately, I'm wearing a sweater today, which I despise right now because it should be springtime. But anyway, we're happy that it's coffee talk. But before we get into um, the conversation today with Councilman Dom, uh, a couple of things I just want to hit on with all of you before we get into all of that. And that is Fairhaven. How many of you have visited Fairhaven? Raise your hand. Let's see the hands. Uh, this is a great interactive tool that has been created by NAR. They launched this um, back in November or so. And it's a really great way for you to sharpen up your skills as it relates to fair housing. It puts you through a bunch of different scenarios. It's, it's attractive and it's fun and it's very thought out. Uh, we are encouraging all of our members to go ahead and check out Fairhaven. So um, if you're looking to maybe go and visit a new virtual place, uh, check out Fairhaven. Code of ethics. The deadline is right around the corner, December 31st. I'm joking around, but it will be here before we know it. If you have completed your code of ethics, get your certificate to us. If you haven't done it, please put it on your radar, get it squared away now. If you have any questions, reach out to Donna LaPera from our professional team. She will help you out. Again, she's the person that you would send your certificate in if you have done it. Remember, you can complete your CE and have a course that relates to the, the code and you can knock out two things with one, with one learning opportunity. So um, if you have done that, make sure Donna knows that so that we're not chasing you guys around uh, at the start of 2022. Um, now's the time to take care of that stuff. And then finally, next Thursday, um, it's gonna be a really great webinar. Um, and that is find your social media voice um, and earn more real estate business. Uh, we have a great panel of spe uh, speakers and presenters, um, including Hank Lerner from PAR, um, a couple of folks who do brand management uh, on a national level with NAR, and then also to um, someone that everybody likes within the industry, Lee Brown. She's going to be a featured speaker there. Uh, this is a really cool thing that GPAR has uh, partnered up with the Denver Association of Realtors, uh, St. Paul area. Association of Realtors, Bridge Association, which is out in the San Francisco area. Uh, we're going up to New England and Cape Cod, that association, and then Greater McAllen, which is right down on the southern border of Texas, right on the border of, of Mexico. So GPAR's professional staff has worked with those associations to put this together. Um, it's a great learning opportunity. It's free. The one catch here, guys, is since the audience is, you could say nation, nationwide, um, there's going to be a lot of people trying to get into, into that. So space is limited. So you need to register in advance. We sent out an email yesterday. I'll drop it into the chat here today. Make sure you register in advance. It's going to be time well spent, good speakers. And let's face it, we have a lot of people who are acting pretty poorly on social media. And then there are some people they don't realize they're crossing the line of poor behavior with social media. This is a great opportunity to figure out how to make it work the right way, keep yourself out of uh, code of ethics, trouble, and to sharpen your skills. So hopefully we will see as many GPAR members as possible in that uh, webinar next Thursday at 12 noon. So with that, we're gonna get into coffee talk and our featured guest is Councilman Alan Dom. Uh, lots of stuff going on. The, the mayor presented his budget last week there's all sorts of things going on. Councilman Dom introduced a package of, of bills that relates to tax reform. Um, so this is gonna be a really good conversation to find out what's going on in City Hall from one of our members. And the conversation will be led by our president, Stephanie Biello. Hey, Stephanie. Good morning, Matt. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Councilman Dom. How are you? Good morning, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Great to have you as always. So three things I wanna to touch on today. Um, I wanna to talk a little bit about the vaccinations, um, how that is going and how that's encouraging businesses to open up and if the city has any kind of plan to open up the city fully, if they hit a certain percentage or um, the numbers start to, 
decline. Um, and then also your package of bills and how that affects the, the budget. We'll talk about that. And one other thing I think um, is on everyone's mind is the violence in the city and maybe touch a little bit on that. Um, so let's start. How are you and how is your team? Well, we're, we're, you know, we're all adapting to the new uh, environment as all of you have, and especially in the real estate business. So we're, we're, we're doing okay and we're seeing uh, the market gradually come back. We're seeing the city become more populated again. We're seeing more businesses open. Every day I say the sun's shining brighter. I think we've turned the corner and, and we're getting better every day. We just have to make sure that we keep our city competitive going forward. Right. So the last 13 months, things are starting to open up. What have you guys learned um, since the pandemic started? And what it, has it taught it about you and your leadership during a pandemic? So I will say this. I think leadership during a pandemic is when it's really important. You don't need leadership when everything's going smoothly. You need it when everything is kind of bumpy like it was. And you know, as in that leadership area, what we did when the pandemic hit in March, my office through my chief of staff, Aaron Sandemore, and my other staff organized several different programs. I'll just share them quickly with you. One was to contact local banks. We contacted 16 of the largest banks in the city, asking them for forbearance across the board. Forbearance meaning not having to pay your payments for three to six months for homeowners who lost their jobs, for small, medium, and large businesses that were suffering. And 16 banks signed on. We had 16 banks giving three to six month forbearance and allowing people to forbear their debt payments uh, during that pandemic, which was huge. Secondly, we had, when the violence occurred, we contacted insurance people and asked them to volunteer to help small businesses file insurance claims. Because in most of the situations, you could not file from the pandemic, but once the violence occurred on these stores, they became eligible for insurance. So we had a 52nd market area in Germantown, all over the city, we were getting small business owners who didn't really understand their policies, getting them to file insurance and getting money back. And third, probably one of our biggest things we did, we formed a hospitality group and understand during this uh, pandemic what occurred. And the PPP loans in the first round, 50%, 50% of the PPP loans went to companies that lost less than 4% of their employees. 50% went to those who lost a lot more. The biggest losers, hospitality, hotels, restaurants, events, airports, arts and culture. Where they touched people, those areas were shut down. So we formed a hospitality group in May. We had over hundred people involved, restaurant owners, event planners, hotels. And we asked them, what do you need from us to accomplish this goal? And that's probably a takeaway from this pandemic. We went out to the actual ownership of these businesses that were affected and asked them for their ideas which is where the best ideas come from. They said, hey, we need outdoor dining bigger than we're doing. We need, we need to have streeteries. We need to take over the streets. We need real estate basically that can allow us to operate. So uh, we sponsored, my office sponsored uh, two bills. One was a streetery, one was a sidewalk bill. Every member of council supported it. Several of them co-sponsored it. It was unanimous. And over 813 restaurants as of today have taken advantage of the outdoor seating and the chalets that you see on the street and one of the great requirements we put in the bill was that the city had to give approval in three days, which is probably unheard of, but the city complied across the board. And I learned a valuable lesson, and all of you know this in real estate, that DIN, you know what DIN is, right? Do it now. It's important to put in legislation timeframes for government to adhere to. So that was one of my take, biggest takeaways is put timeframes in legislation when possible. It, it, what I'd like to work on next in that area is to throw out everything we've been doing in the city and, and, and the area of the licenses and inspections and zoning, et cetera, and put timeframes attached to each piece of requirement. Like if you wanna open a business, it takes 60 days, here's how we do it. If you wanna do this, it takes 45. Give people a time frame. I had an experience up in, uh, I call it Port Fishington. It's right below Port Richmond and right above Fishtown, okay? Huntington and Gall, a restaurant opened up, it took them 18 months to open. And then after six months, he closed. Took him 18 months to get through the process of the city. That's unacceptable. So the takeaway for me was leadership, attach timeframes, go to the people that are most affected and ask them for their ideas. They have the best ideas. And people in government don't have the ideas. The people working in the jobs and the businesses have the ideas and gather those ideas from them. So how has that, how are those businesses doing now? You, you 
initiated that in the beginning of the pandemic, or like towards the beginning of the pandemic. How are they doing now? So I would say that we have 6,000 restaurants in the city and about, I think we're gonna lose probably 20% of those restaurants, unfortunately. Um, the ones that have survived, most of them are doing pretty well right now. Not all, but pretty well. Many of them are actually doing more business today than they did in 2019, only because they have more seating with the ability to capture the outside seating. In the, the original bill, we extended the seating through, through the end of December, 2020, mm -hmm. and we extended it until the end of 2021. We're now looking at making that bill permanent to see if that's a possibility. So we'd have outdoor seating, the chalets or parklets permanent. I think it's a game changer for the city, mm -hmm. which leads me, Stephanie, to one of the biggest, biggest things we need to do in the city is bring back the lifestyle of the city. Before the pandemic, people would live in the city for lifestyle and walk to work or be convenient to work or take mass transportation to work. And now the lifestyle piece has become far greater and that lifestyle is gonna be key to bring people back. And that is a direct, it directly affects the real estate also um, in some of these neighborhoods. So that brings me to, I guess, your package of bills. And with this pandemic where we see people working from home more, um, what, so your package of bills talks about the wage, the wage tax. Do you wanna talk about um, sure. the key points on that? On those fact, packages? I'm, I'm gonna need everyone on this call support. We have what, 62 participants right now, but we'll need all, over what, 2,500, Matt, you have in the uh, association. I'll need everyone's support on, there's three bills, I'll give you the explanation. One, it has to do with the wage taxes. New Governor Rendell, when he was mayor, the wage tax was 4.97 back in the 90s. He set out a program to lower it down to just about under 4%, 3.9, took over 15 or 20 years to do that. This is similar to what he did. Our current wage taxes for residents of the city is 3.87%. This bill lowers the wage taxes over the next 20 years down to 2.9 to try to make us more competitive. The whole key here is we have to be competitive as a city to bring back the business in the city and to bring back the people. We can no longer keep doing things the same way. The best example is Pew did a study showing the top 20 cities and how they fared in this last debacle in the pandemic budget wise. Detroit was the worst city by far, 17% loss in their budget. But second was Philadelphia at 14.7. An example, Baltimore was 5.4% shortage. Atlanta was 5.6% shortage. Boston was like 1.9. We were 14.7. To me, that is a report card on what we've been doing the last several years and it has not worked well. And we need to change dramatically what we're doing. So in the wage tax, it's messaging to send to residents and non-residents. The resident wage will go down to 2.9 in 20 years. The non-resident goes to 2.8. It's a message that says, hey, you know, Philadelphia, we want you to come back. We appreciate you. We're trying to help you recover from this pandemic. And we want you in the city. We're very reliant right now on wage taxes, which really affects uh, our budget. But this is a slow process to get there. But getting to 2.9, sending that message out is important. The second bill has to do with that we did a study. <clears throat> and these are all based on studies. We just don't pick this out of the air. And a lot of this came about in the last six years, sitting in council, hearing these uh, hearings in the, on the finance committee. We've had experts all over the country tell us two things. You have very high business income taxes and you're the only city in the United States that taxes net income and gross receipts. You're the only one. From Denver, an expert told us two months ago, New York, Philadelphia, whether it's Paul Levy, Steve Mullen, or other experts all over the uh, country, they've all told us two things. Your corporate income taxes are super high and no one charges for gross receipts and net income. So we did a study on the corporate net income of the top 20 cities in the country. New York was number one. And I'm counting city and state because that's what you have to look at as a business here, the taxes for both. New York was at 17.2%. Philadelphia was at 16.2%. And all the other cities were below 10. Philadelphia 16.2, New York 17.2, every other city below 10. Now, if you're an existing business in the city of Philadelphia and you want to expand, you're going to be faced with that kind of taxation of almost 6% higher if you're in the city versus the suburbs or somewhere else, or you're looking to come to Philadelphia and open a business, you're probably not going to do it unless you're in what's called a Keystone Opportunity Zone, a KOZ. And that's where these companies have gone. 
The net income tax bill we presented over 10 years reduces the net income tax from 6.2 down to three in 10 years. I like to wipe it out totally, but that's a start. So it reduces it down to three. The third bill, which is, deals with gross receipts and net income, requires you to pay the higher of the two. So we get out of being the only city in the country that taxes both. I picture this, we tax gross receipts and net income. So you can have a business that loses money and we tax you. You can have a business that makes a little money and we tax you on the gross receipts and the net income. So this bill requires you just to pay the higher of the two, not both. So that's kind of the overview of the package. And the goal here, Stephanie, is we need Philadelphia to come out of this competitive. Other states mm -hmm. are coming out of this very competitive, very competitive. I mean, I just heard the governor of Florida is calling tech companies all over the country and telling them to come to Florida. Florida's getting a thousand new residents a day because they're competitive. We need to make Philadelphia competitive. We can no longer continue on the same track. And the report card to me is that Pew report that shows what we've done in the past has failed. Let me ask you a question. So these taxes that are on the books now, have they always been there and it's just we haven't addressed them over time and <clears throat> the pandemic just kind of brought it to light and these other cities that are below the 10 percent were they were similar bills did they reduce it or have they always been under 10 percent they've always been under 10 these bills i was going to introduce before the pandemic i held them up because of the pandemic i was planning on introducing them last march until the pandemic hit so I held them for the last 12 months. I didn't want to introduce them during the pandemic. So, but I wanted to get them in before the current budget. But here's the problem. We've always had this issue. Look, we're the, there's a reason why we're the largest city with the highest poverty rate of over 25%. We have the lowest income, average income of the top 20 cities. Um, look at the statistics. The statistics point to what we've been doing hasn't really been successful. There's facts here. It's, this is not like just plucking into the air. I mean, there's reasons why we have the low job for creation here. It's the taxation policy. Now, so, so is there is there one thing in this that City Hall is just not looking at or is this, and I'm just gonna be <laughs> blind, is it politics? Like, is it just, is it a unilateral, no, we're not doing it? Or is there parts of this bill that they're <laughs> hesitant on and why can't we talk about that? So here, look, I will say this, give some credit to Mayor Kenny, because after I introduced the bills in his budget that he presented, he did produce, uh, produce basically on these two bills, a variation of what I produced. But I feel it was very, very slight as an example. His reduction over five years for wage taxes will average $4.60 a year. It's like you'll be able to buy an extra cup of coffee per year. I don't know that that's gonna move the needle you know, mine was about 10 times that difference. So I think there's a big difference in what we proposed. His proposal on the net income would take it from 6.2 down to the high fives over five years. Mine goes down to three in 10 years. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying to my colleagues is it is important. This is an investment in the tax structure of the city of Philadelphia. Every one of you invests in your business, whether it's through marketing, social media, you invest in your business. This is an investment in the city's tax structure to grow the base, to grow the economy, so we have more people here to pay taxes. You need to do that if you want to expand our economy and you want to have the money to pay for all the issues we have across the city. You know, an interesting fact, from 18th and Walnut, in a 10-block radius in every direction, 60% of the city's tax revenues are generated. Think about that. That's a very powerful statement. They have to protect that area and make sure those revenues come in because mm -hmm. those revenues we need to invest in neighborhoods across the city. All right, is there anything in that bill? Um, we talked about the, the wage, the gross tax, gross and net. Um, is there, talking about the gross receipt and the net income, is there an agreement in council that it doesn't make sense to tax both? I will say this, I think some people feel that way. I think many yeah. people are, are against lowering any taxes and they mm -hmm. want to raise taxes. And that's not going to be healthy because people have choices. We're already seeing a large portion of our population that can um, leave the city, have left the city, and many have moved to Florida. I mean, I'm sure all of you know people have said to you, sell my home, I'm staying in Florida, I'm not coming back. We don't want that to happen. We want to be competitive. 
Let me mention two other data points, Stephanie, that will lead you to believe that taxation is a problem. Of the five largest cities on the East Coast, we have the lowest population of people who work in our urban city versus the suburbs. We have more people in the suburbs than the city. Atlanta, Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore even have more people in the city working than in the suburbs. We don't. We're the reverse. That's because of our taxation policies. I mean, you can't, Philadelphia is not an island. And, and the best example is we have business formation of black and brown businesses, um, Asian, um, Latino, and white. We're the lowest formation of businesses of the top five cities on the East Coast. Lowest. Atlanta's higher than us, Baltimore. Boston's higher than us. Everyone's higher than us. Why? It's the taxation policies. And they're comfortable with it. They don't, you know, you heard, You may have seen some of my colleagues tweeting after I introduced the bills saying I was providing trickle-down economics. This is not trickle-down economics. This has been told to us by experts across the country. There's no trickle-down here. People have choices. People can say, you know what, I'm not coming to Philadelphia. I'm going to go to Baltimore. I'm going to go to New York. Look at Oatly. Oatly is up, I think, in Kensington. They open a corporate office. They put their manufacturing plant in South Jersey with all the jobs because of yeah. the taxation policy. Yeah. It's real. It is real. So with the pandemic, um, vaccinations opening up, how many businesses in Center City are shifting more to work at home? I mean, like this is just a guesstimate. I mean. I, I, I look at the train stations, I see the empty parking lots, um, that's concerning. Is it because, I mean, how many companies are shutting down in Center City and doing more work at home and not using the space in town? So I think each of us has our own personal viewpoint on that, that we see personal situations like, you know, like I, I saw an office user that had two full floors of 6,600 square feet, uh, calls and say, we don't need one floor, we're giving it up. That's 50%. When I spoke to the people from JLL and CBRE recently in the last week, they're forecasting about a 15% uh, shrinkage in the office market. But they're also forecasting a natural growth of about five or 6% and another five or 6% of growth because companies that had these co-working environments, people are not gonna come back to sitting across from each other at a, a co-working environment. They're gonna need more space to accommodate the needs. So I think it's early, too early to tell. I think what we will miss and the connectivity is going to be missed. Like, think about this. You're a lawyer that just graduates from school and you're going to work in a law firm and there's no one around. You're working from home. How do you get the mentorship? Even the real estate, yeah. how, do get, how do you get that mentorship? That, that's a problem. Yeah, I agree. So how do you how do you feel that's going to affect real estate? Well, I think you might see some conversion of some of the office buildings back to residential. I think the key for us mm -hmm. in the city is to make sure we make our lifestyle really, really good. Because people now have choices. You've heard of Zoom towns all over the country where people go and live and they Zoom into their meetings. But you know, that's gonna, after a while, it won't be as powerful as it is now, but we will lose some. And the people will only choose Philadelphia if they love the lifestyle. And that's very important. That's gonna be number one by far, the lifestyle of living in the city. Think about how many people who lived in the city and maybe left during the pandemic because they didn't have a lifestyle here. They were still working, but they left because the lifestyle wasn't here or they didn't feel safe. So can we come up with a plan to make sure businesses can operate safely without compromising health and safety? Well, I think we're working on that. We're trying to push the health commissioner a bit and uh, haven't been totally successful with that. I did email him uh, Monday of this week asking him when we'll be able to go to at least 50% without the air requirements in our restaurants. Right now, we have a requirement in restaurants of 25%, but if you qualify for certain airflow, you can go to 50%. Yeah. The requirement to get to 50% is extremely difficult for most restaurant operators. Of the 6,000 restaurants, I think about 150, 160 have complied. And the bigger issue is I think two or three were minority because of the cost they couldn't afford to do it. But the requirement we're putting on restaurants right now we're the only city in the United States that has that requirement. It's a requirement that's almost equal to an emergency room in a hospital. It's overkill, basically, is what I'm being told by the Restaurant Association. So we're trying to convince the health commissioner to relax that a bit. I also asked them about, like in Jersey, they're seating 10 people at a table. And in the suburbs of Philadelphia, they're at 75%. And 
and you can sit at a bar and order food and or drink. And I, I actually feel that is so unfair. Like we're not an island here. People have choices. If you have a party of eight or 10, you want to go out to dinner with your family, you're going to go to the suburbs and the Philadelphia restaurants are going to suffer from that. It's not fair to Philadelphia residents. It's not fair to the Philadelphia business owners. So I'm working on that. I will say that I'm probably the most vocal in that area. <laughs> and uh, you know, the one thing I do love about my job is that, uh, what are they going to do? Fire me? I don't really care. I'm not, <laughs> I have no one to answer to. Let them fire me. So I just tell the way it is. And uh, you know, I was pretty vocal with the health commissioner and the mayor about using the link as, as yeah. a vaccination center. I mean, when 25 other cities are using their outdoor stadiums for vaccination centers, Philadelphia should have been doing it. You know, our mm -hmm. plan, the Eagles were on board, so was the University of Penn, so was every hospital, so was SEPTA, everyone was on board except the mayor. And our plan was just to have the link set up to do 8,000 shots a day as a FEMA site. And then when the second shot was available, the link could do 16,000 shots a day. So it didn't happen because the mayor decided not to do it, but 25 other cities used it successfully. And we actually had a plan in place, not only to use it for Philadelphia, but there was an idea that we raised with the Eagles and they were in favor of it to set up a separate site once this was up and running to vaccinate all of the suburbanites. And we're not an island. We need suburbanites. We're, we, we have to work together. I mean, 41% of the people who work in the city live in the suburbs. We want to get them vaccinated so they can come back to work. This is a regional thing, not just a Philadelphia thing. So how is it going with the vaccination and distribution? Are we, um, is it flowing? Do we still need areas where we can have the vaccinations? Um, what is the temperature there with that? So, you know, I've been probably, again, the most vocal about this to the mayor and the health commissioner that we did not have a plan really that we could implement for vaccinations. And that's what we were talking about from day one. Where is our plan to implement vaccinations? And this is very simple. If you have a city of a population of a million six and you want to get to herd immunity of 70%, you probably have to vaccinate ballpark a million people. And you can't count on the J&J &J shots. So just count on 2 million shots, right? Two shots per person, 2 million shots. Over the next three, four months, how do you implement 2 million shots when the President of the United States says you'll be getting enough vaccines? We wanted to see a plan. We never really saw that plan. They never really had a plan. And that was our biggest concern. And as of three weeks ago, the city has been stockpiling 100,000 vaccines that they haven't basically given out. So, and then you talk about uh, the vaccination, when you compare Philadelphia to the state of Pennsylvania, we're 25% below the vaccination rates in the state. We're 26% below the vaccination rates in Jersey, and we're below Delaware and other states. We just have not done a great job in rolling out the vaccine. And why is that? I mean, You know, why? I will say this. <laughs> rolling out the vaccine is a logistics uh, mm -hmm really a logistics issue, okay? Sure. You need someone who really understands logistics and how to roll it out. We wanted to use the link and the man. We wanted to have drive-through. Look, we offered ideas like, you know, when this was early on, if a young person brings someone over 75 years of age, let them both get vaccinated. We want to get everyone vaccinated. This is herd immunity. We want everyone vaccinated. And we were just, I think, too cautious on that. And we're worried about not having enough vaccines. We were, our problem was not having enough vaccines. Our problem was we never have enough places to implement the vaccines. I mean, when you have Penn and the Eagles who put in an RFP for the link and haven't had an answer in three or four weeks from the mayor, that's not, that's not right. Mm -hmm. No. All right. So if there's anything you need us to do to get the word out for vaccination sites, please let us know about that. Um, we definitely right. want to get vaccinations, herd immunity, get things operating up and running we're done. We're done with being shut in. Hey, Stephanie, this. Stephanie, there's a very relevant question here in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Councilman, what is the city doing in terms of uh, pub public service announcements as it relates to the vaccine for those who are hesitant to go ahead and, and get the shot? You know, you're hearing this. Um, I heard Val Arkush saying this just the other day for Montgomery County that they're trying to ramp up their efforts. Governor Murphy over in New Jersey was talking about their strategy as it relates to, to penetrating those folks who are reluctant. Uh, what's the city have in its game plan for reaching out to those kinds of folks to break down those barriers? So I did question uh, Commissioner Farley about three weeks ago on this on the call. And I said to him, <clears throat> you need like you need 
football players, you need basketball players, you need sports people out there marketing that they got the shot and you should get your shot too. I mean, even having ads with the Sixers, you know, I just took a shot with them shooting the basketball and getting the shot in their arm. You need more publicity out there. And even as realtors, you should be putting on your social media, I've been vaccinated. The more marketing we can do of those who've been vaccinated, the better. And we do need to get that 70% herd immunity. But the, the CDC says the resistance in Philadelphia, which is kind of interesting, is 17%. That's on the CDC website, which means 17% of our population, according to CDC, is resistant to get the vaccination. We're, we're like in the below 50% that have been vaccinated at this point. We're way down. So there's still plenty to, to get vaccinated. All right. So how about the numbers? Are the numbers um, with the hospitals and everything, um, is that relevant to opening? Like, is that part of the marriage plan? So the yeah, capacity and that sort of thing? The health commissioner is concerned because some of the numbers of COVID are rising. Mm -hmm. um, so he's concerned about that. And I guess people are relaxing themselves a bit, which we shouldn't be doing. We need to continue to be very careful and vigilant and wearing masks whenever required. And there've been some people, you know, I've even noticed it on the street. I see more people now walking outside without any masks. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, my son was in Arizona uh, this week and he took a video of a uh, restaurant. Not one person, including the servers, had masks on there. It's amazing yeah. to me how it's so different across the country. It is. All right, so let's talk about one other serious issue in Philadelphia, the violent crime. Um, it seems to be spiraling out of control. Um, last year, we had 499 homicides, and we're now on pace for record-breaking 600 homicides. And we haven't even gotten into the warm weather um, where everybody's out and about. So what's going on, and how do we address this issue? I'll share my thoughts, but I would be curious to hear your Matt Braden's thoughts coming out of the DA's office, uh, but I'll share my thoughts first. I think we need to focus on the eight zip codes that have the highest rates of violence right now. And we know those eight zip codes. And I think we need to go in there with programs that will really calm the situation down and reduce the violence dramatically and focus strictly on those eight zip codes. That should be the focus. We know the eight zip codes where the highest level of crime is. That should be the total, total focus. And a lot of it, I mean, I, there's probably, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 people that are committing the majority of these crimes. You know, I'll give an example. You may have seen that shooting that occurred at Budokan, okay? And what happened there was horrible. It was a young couple from the Sharswood housing complex. He took her out for her 25th birthday, okay? And she goes onto Instagram and posts that she's celebrating at Budokan, her 25th birthday. And... I don't know if she knew or not, but he was in, he's involved in like a, uh, I guess a drug war with others from 22nd and Diamond, okay? And they saw that on Instagram and four people from that neighborhood came down in a van with Maryland plates. And as he left Budokan, shot him 27 times. I mean, that's like crazy, but that's again, drug related. Like, how do you get, how do you get people into that neighborhood and say, look, this isn't the way to resolve conflict. We need, this is not gonna be, there's no good ending here. Well, we need to put people in place in these high crime districts that really can calm the situation. But it leads to a much bigger issue, and that is the issue of poverty. And that is also the issue of education. And if you ever thought there was a time when we should change what we're teaching in schools, it is now. I mean, when you think about it, we should make that investment that I've talked about before of teaching financial literacy from pre-K to 12th grade, teaching entrepreneurship pre-K to 12th grade, teaching technology, pre-K to 12th grade. How important is that? Every one of us on this call has increased our technology skills from this pandemic, and it's shown the value of it. And when you think about what we're teaching in schools, you know, 25 years ago, the top five companies were not who they are today. They were probably General Motors, Ford, Exxon, maybe AT&T. Who are they today? Amazon, Google, Apple. It's a different world. We're not teaching for that economy of today or tomorrow. The other piece I will add to that, and I'm a very big believer, is making sure 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders work one day a week in a job, go to school for four weeks. Give them that option. That is a game changer. Christo Ray does it. Maybe one or two other high schools think Vox has a similar program, but not as in-depth. But if we give kids that opportunity of working one day a week, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade in a job, four different jobs, 
it's a game changer for them. That's socialization, learning, being around other people, and maybe they even get a summer job from that company. That is a game changer. And I can't figure out why we can't move the needle on this because that to me is how you solve poverty in the long term. It could take 15 or 20 years. I may not be here then, but that's how you solve it. So I think that's a great idea. I think everybody needs, especially at a young age, and it teaches them so much more than just financial responsibility, but just personal responsibility, pride, and um, having purpose in life. Are there companies that are willing to take on these students for that one day? I mean, that's where I would see, you know, and not an issue, but where where it could get hung up. Like how I think, many? Yeah. I think we'd be surprised how many companies would take on students. You know, I take on, I have eight students. I take on four students at Chris Del Rey in my in the real estate office. And I have four mm -hmm. students at the city council office. So I have eight students. I think there are many companies that would support students and want to see them exceed and like adopt them or mentor them for a year. I think they would love to do that. I think many people on this call would, would do that. Yeah. You know, we yeah. talked about even having, you know, I, I think I talked to Matt about this. We should probably look at to see if we can get a junior real estate license through the mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Real Estate Commission. Okay. So the kids that are 15, 16, 17, whatever, can help other realtors in the real estate business and, and train them and get them involved in that profession. I think that's really, really important. Yeah, I know um, President Opler, NAR President Charlie Opler, he was talking about the mentorship program too um, in real estate. So I think that's, it's a great idea. And- um, uh, Stephanie, you, know, if the, you and Matt should lead the charge with the PAR and see what we can get <laughs> the licensing seriously and see if we can get a junior real estate license for, for young people to get into our profession. I mean, when you think about yeah. it, most people go into real estate because they were not great at something else and they found a pathway. When I was in college, I, you know, I wasn't going into real estate. I was in the time lock business. People like fall into real estate. Let's have them considered as a career path. Yeah, and part of that be um, kind of like appraisers who have to go do a two-year apprenticeship with um, a firm or with tee up with another um, real estate agent. I think it's a great idea. Um, Let me mention something so, about yeah. financial literacy. For those of you who don't know, I do have a program at the Federal Reserve that we have sponsored. Uh, we've now paid for 178 public school teachers. If you know many public school teachers who want to take the class, it's about, I think, four or five days. It's at the end of the school year. It was suspended this year because of COVID, but it'll start up again soon. Have them contact me. Uh, we have 178 teachers that have taken it. You know, if you think about it, with 30 kids in a class, we're now teaching from pre-K to 12 about 5,000 students in our public schools financial literacy. We need to do it, expand it. And I would say to you and Matt, you should have a financial literacy course for realtors. We should have it for mm -hmm. city council, okay, and the government. And I say that because way back, I was a member of the top 300 realtors in the country. Half of them, half, had no money. Why? They lived above their means. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, okay. like, that's very important. I think um, there were, I was thinking of you because there was this young woman, she was 15 years old and she went before city council or her school board. Um, it wasn't in Philadelphia to have a class in high school to teach kids exactly what you're talking about, how to manage, how to do a checkbook. I don't know if anybody does checkbook, but balancing your bank accounts and learning the impact of credit cards, interest rates, that sort of thing. And she won and there's a course. So I'm going to find that article and I'm going to send it to you. I thought it was fabulous. So but, but um, think about this, Stephanie, if realtors did understand financial literacy, they couldn't be successful. If anyone opening no. a business doesn't understand, understand financial literacy, you can't be successful. That is a foundation that you need to build on. Absolutely. Okay, I'm just looking in the chat here. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about with the violence and um, how you see it impacting real estate? Well, I, would, I would like to hear Matt Braden's comments on the violence because he, he has a great knowledge of being in the district attorney's office. What was it, 11 years ago, Matt? Uh, nine years ago, this past weekend, I left after... 12 and a half years at the Philadelphia DA's office. I interned there before. I worked in the uh, prosecutor's office in Miami. A um, little bit of background with law enforcement, just a little. So what's your thoughts, Matt? Because you probably have more knowledge than me. 
Well, I think it comes back to, to this. Um, as it relates to our industry, I don't think you have to, it takes much to understand that crime has a direct impact on the attractiveness as a whole. Uh, you go ahead and you look at the news, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. Um, and it, it, it very much gets in the psyche of, of folks and it brings a perception. And when you have, look at this conversation today, people have more and more options, or at least now they're realizing they have more and more options. And so when you see that you have options that even though they were there before, they're there more prevalent now, maybe something that has a negative to it gets X'd out as an option. And so when we go ahead and we look at what's happening with crime in our city, I, I use the analogy a lot of times of, of a wheel. Obviously I'm in the cycling and you have a hub and then you have spokes. And when spokes cross one another and they tie into the hub, those spokes that cross become stronger. The wheel becomes stronger. It can go faster. It can move forward. It can move in a straight line. It does all these things, but the spokes have to be doing their job and they have to be crossing one another. And sometimes what happens with some of this stuff as it relates to law enforcement is that the spokes aren't crossing. They're not tying into a hub and that goes to leadership and that goes to city hall. You know, the second floor has a lot of sway over a lot of departments and they need to make sure that those spokes are crossing. Those departments are the spokes and they have to be willing to push. So when we talk about say like operation pinpoint, we talk about the zip codes of which you see where crime is happening. Law enforcement has tools. They know who is doing a lot of stuff. So focus on those things. There's a lot of other things going on as well. We look in the chat here, you see that there's a lot of idle time. There's la lack of structure with school. Um, there's lots of things that are going on. You have pandemic, you have, you have economic problems, all that stuff. But that doesn't mean that you don't rise to the task. So we go ahead and we look at it. Operation Pinpoint is a new name where you go ahead before we, we were championing focus deterrence when I was in city council. You gotta get people on board to push forward. Instead of finding reasons not to do something, do something. We're talking about lives here. We're not talking about litter on the street. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't clean the streets, but people's lives are being destroyed. And if we did not have the incredible, incredible, medical facilities that we have here in Philadelphia, our rates of homicide would be even higher. What we have at Temple University and the ability of those surgeons to go ahead and handle gunshot wound victims, those numbers would be out of control. We have what military has on the battlefield in North Philadelphia at Temple. If we didn't have that, we would have far more death here in the city. We would have far more families destroyed. I'll just end with this. Uh, in the course of my career, I did a lot of stuff with um, moms who had to bury their children from gunshot wounds. And it just, the saddest part is that the story gets played over and over and over, no matter, I was involved with them almost 20 years ago. And unfortunately, it just keeps on going. And we just need to have a will to do the right thing. There's no one single thing that's going to do it. Again, it spokes on a wheel. So, hey, man, I'm just going to say this. Um, you should have had this speech a year ago because we may have drafted you for the DA's office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an attorney. <laughs> that was excellent, really. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions here in the in the chat is the um, what are some of the more immediate things the city is implementing to reduce crime or violence, crime slash violence? Well, you know, we had uh, a few weeks ago, I had Commissioner Outlaw and Erica Atwood uh, from the city on a Zoom with over 100 people discussing these issues. And you know, they're focused on those eight zip codes. They're focused on deterrence. They're focused on all these different programs. I'm not sure how successful these programs have been. I will say that we've uh, talked to a few groups that have done programs in the past, especially during uh, Mayor Nutter's term, who had real progress. And we're looking at Chicago and New York that have done in certain neighborhoods have made real progress with focused intervention, focused deterrence. So hopefully we can get those programs implemented. I mean, every day I'm getting an, uh, a contact from a different violence prevention group uh, to, for their idea, but we have to vet these ideas and make sure they're productive. 
And one of the things we haven't really done well as a city is determine of the dollars we invest in all these programs, what is producing results? What's productive? Is it hitting our objective? I don't think we're great at measuring the investments we make. Councilman, yeah. I, I'd like to chime in on that. So if we go back, if we go back when I was saying about focused deterrence and I now has the new name of pinpoint, if there's full buy-in from everybody, you can reduce homicides by 65% or greater. It's proven, it's been going on for 25 years, the, but the studies also show that if you do not fully invest in it, if everybody is not pulling in the right same direction, it will collapse. Baltimore tried it, not everybody was on board, everybody got into their silos and their turf wars and then wasn't successful. But if everybody buys in and you know, you go to Dr. Kennedy up at John Jay College of uh, Criminal Justice, I mean, it's it. It's a winning formula. You just have to get the buy-in. Hey, Matt, after this call, we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy it. Whatever it takes, I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, I will say this to you, Stephanie, and all the members of G4. Uh, first of all, thank you, Stephanie, for serving a second year. That is amazing, especially during the pandemic. We're all very appreciative. That's really great. And I will also share with you that uh, Matt Braden, to me, is like a consigliere. I call him on so many different things in council that he's been very helpful to me because I don't have the answers. Matt has a lot of answers. Not only was he in the DA's office, he was in council. Uh, and he worked there for a long time. So Matt, I appreciate all the help you've been giving me and thank you. He is great. He's a, he's done a great job through this pandemic for our association and just going with it when we needed to and leading, taking the charge and leading. And there are many associations across the country that are modeling what GPAR has done um, through the pandemic. Um, the seminars, the webinars, the Zooms, the coffee talks, um, just a true example of how to disseminate the information, getting it out to the members and keeping them informed, did a great job. Great, great job. Absolutely. So that was it. And your coffee talks were good too, Steph. Yeah, I like the coffee talks. They're fun. They're fun and have coffee and um, but anyway, so is there anything that you want to talk about real estate related? We have a few minutes here. Um, I, we have some questions about education. Um, I think that's, um, you know, a direct correlation to violence and, um, reducing it, um, poverty jobs. Um, but is there anything you want to talk I will, about? I will, I will share, um, two bills that I did pass uh, this past year, we passed a bunch of them, but these two I haven't mentioned. One is called the Wholesaler Bill, which has to do with all these mm -hmm. signs you may see in, in neighborhoods that say, we buy your home for cash. And that Wholesaler Bill, really I was just the vehicle to get that bill passed. That came from GPAR and Matt, who then smartly coordinated with CLS. So you picture this, CLS and GPAR <laughs> together on a bill, all I did was introduce it, okay? But it was a great bill, and that was because of GPAR. You guys did a great job. And I'll tell you what that bill is about, basically. It basically regulates wholesalers uh, who are trying to take advantage, not all, but a few, of homeowners in the city and puts in some protections so those homeowners at least have a better understanding of the value of their home, puts in a code of ethics. If people kept, you know, all of you are probably getting phone calls or emails or texts from people, I want to buy your home. There's also a do not solicit list. I get them all the time, so it's amazing to me. And sometimes I get phone calls in the middle of a meeting. Do you own a property at so and so? It's, it's really annoying. But this was the wholesaler bill that came from GPAR, and GPAR smartly uh, championed it with CLS, which I thought was great. The other bill I passed was the wage tax bill, and this bill had to do with helping lower income people. Sadly, we did a research again that showed Philadelphia and the top 25 cities taxes lower income people the highest. And then we wonder why they're in poverty, but we tax them the highest. People under $30,000, $32,000 a year. We tax them at 18.1%. Every other city was between 10 and 14%. Phoenix, New York, Chicago, LA, 10 to 14%. So the wage tax bill, the concept is it re reimburses lower income people, the wage taxes that we're collecting from them. They can barely afford to pay for food or pay bills they, we shouldn't be collecting wage taxes from them. So that's the whole goal of this bill. We think the average refund could be in the range for a family of about $800 a year, and it could affect 40 to 50,000 families in the city. 
and it could help 140,000 people considering how many people are in each family. So that's, a, that's based on data. And I thought that was a really good bill to help people. Not everyone will climb out, but it'll help people in poverty be able to pay bills and put food on the table. So those are just two bills I just wanted to mention. They're great bills. And anything we can do, it just, your new package of bills, it sounds like common sense. And I think everybody, I talk to a lot of people, I'm not gonna say everybody, I talk to a lot of people and it's just so burned out from hearing all the politics and this one arguing over this one, over um, meaningless, um, stupid stuff that they, they're arguing over. And here we have this bill that could really help a lot of people and help the city all around, yeah. real estate, um, restaurants, everything. How do you get that word out? How can we get the word out? Like, this is common sense. Take a look at this. This has nothing political. It's, this is what's going to help the city. I would say I need every one of you on this call to be calling every, every council person, 17 of us, calling, writing to them, calling their staff, writing to them, calling the mayor, writing to them. You got you to gotta be all over them. You have to really, really have like a call to action. And, you know, th think about it. Am I in favor of helping people that have social issues? Absolutely, but we need money to do that. And if there ever was a time for us to make ourselves more competitive, this is that opportunity. We're getting $1.4 billion from the federal government, 1.4 billion over two years. The school district is getting 1.3 billion. That's an amazing amount of money for the city to have into their system. Now is the time for us to invest some of that money, a very small portion. This might cost 70 or $80 million, a very small portion to grow our economic tax base. Because if we don't do this now, in four years from now, we'll be saying, all right, we're gonna have to raise taxes. We're gonna have to do this. Let's try to grow that base so we have more people paying taxes in the city so we'll be able to help all those social issues that we all wanna help. We wanna help. Right, so exactly. Councilman, Great question. Oh, go ahead. Councilman, what's the timeline on your bills? Uh, is there a committee hearing scheduled for them? It's not scheduled yet. We're trying to get into the finance committee. I'm not sure we'll be successful. It might be in the committee of the whole, but in the next two or three weeks, I'm sure it has to be heard. So we'll, we'll let you know what, what's going on there so you can get active in that. But that's so really important. So you're trying to tie it in with the, with the budget? Absolutely. All right, so there was a question I was gonna say, how can we find out the names and phone numbers and emails of the council members? And I think Aaron put that in the chat. So if you're curious um, um, who to contact, contact everyone <laughs> and, um, and write it. Do we have like a, um, maybe Matt, we could send, I don't know if we can do this and I'm putting him on the spot. I don't wanna be, liable for any of this, but is there a um, call to action that we could do for our members, like a sample letter to send to the council in favor of this? So first thing, uh, this is a little lesson on how GPAR functions and mm -hmm. operates. Remember, we're a member-driven association and we're comprised of a board of directors who are my bosses. Um, I report to them. And then uh, we have committees that report to the board. And so we have a government affairs committee, the government affairs committee, uh, which our staff liaison is Melody Zimmerman. Melody works with the, the chair of that committee, which is Roderick Walker. And they go ahead and they look at all the bills that come in the city council that are related to our industry that may have some sort of impact, whether it's good or bad, whatever, whatever it might be. That committee, which is comprised of 10 other people in addition to Roderick, they look at all that legislation and make a determination about what the position should be of the association. So as it stands right now, they have yet to go ahead and look at, they haven't met yet since that uh, package of bills were introduced that will be on their next agenda. They make a decision, they say, hey, this is good for us. Then we look at what the next steps are to go ahead and uh, support that legislation if that's the position that they take. It all depends on um, the position of the, of the association. We look at resources and then also too, we may be, I'm saying this in a general sense, not these bills in particular. If we wind up being against something or for something, we then go ahead and look at, hey, is this the hill that you die on? Or is this something maybe you just offer up a letter of support or maybe you make a phone call or something along those lines? Or if it's something that's really central to what is important to the association, then boom, you know, we'll, we'll do what we have to do, look at the resources that it takes and find the most effective way to help get our voice 
heard by those in city council or the mayor's office. All right. So you guys just saw what happens between Matt and I. <laughs> I'll say, let's go for something. And he'll say, pump the brakes. <laughs> but <laughs> Process. It's the um, process. It's the process. And I'm very impatient when I'm passionate about something that you can see. You can see the end result. And you know it's going to be a positive thing all around, um, not only for the city, for our industry, and for our clients, too. So um, yeah, we'll be on top of this. Um, I think. Aaron put that in there. So um, I guess we're, we're emailing them. We're not sending out templates, but Alan, what do we want to say? We're in support or I, I really encourage you to take a look at Alan's bill, the number, you have all of that. Or... Well, you know, we can get you that information, but I think you know, the commentary should be of the, all the cities in the United States, we're the only city that charges for gross receipts and net income which has been a problem getting businesses to expand here and open here. And of the top 25 cities in the country, we have the second highest income tax at 16.2. Everyone else is below 10. Those are real, real facts that are hurting our economy. And in the big picture, when you take the amount of money we're talking about, which is 70 to $80 million, let's put this in context. The mayor's budget now is like 5.2 billion. This is about 1.5% of the total budget to reinvest, to grow our economy. The mayor's budget since he's been in, has, let's be, it's grown from 4 billion to 5.2. I hope it doesn't grow up to 6 billion by the time he leaves. That would be a 50% increase in spending. And I've asked this question in council and among my colleagues, show me of the $1.2 billion that we've increased spending in the last five or six years, what are the benefits and the results? What has been the return on that investment? Yeah. No one can tell me that. Can't tell me. That. In fact, if you look at the crime, as, as others have said and Matt said, it's worse. So I'm not sure we're doing a great job there, but these tax bills, when you put them in context, 1.5 to 1.6% of the total budget, it is worth the investment. All right. Well, Councilman, we're almost at the end of the hour. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Thank you for spending it with us. But there is one really, there's a question in here that I always talk about is why won't the city sell some of its land bank properties if we were running in a 500 million deficit? I always ask about the land bank and those properties. Well, there's a lot of things the city should do. Uh, they, I know. <laughs> they, they cut the prison budget even further than they have because the prison population is way down. But there should be a more aggressive sale of the land bank. And look, I think Mark Squilla, Councilman Mark Squilla, was probably one of the most effective in selling off land in his district. He had an auction, sold, I don't know, 50 or 100 properties at one fell swoop. Uh, but many other district council members are not in favor of disposing of some of this land that quickly. So that's been part of the issue. You know, I saw something in the chat about uh, drop. Just to give you an idea, we did try to eliminate drop uh, two or three years ago and met with a stone wall, but no elected official who gets elected now is eligible for drop. It's only for uh, the current workers in city hall, but not elected officials who are elected now. And the other piece I will say, and Aaron reminded me of this, this is really about a pro jobs program. We're talking about growing the economic base through jobs. And we haven't done a great job in the past five years compared to other cities. We're still kind of at the bottom of job creation of the top cities in the country. We can do better. I mean, we can be really competitive. We're in a great position. We have the most affordable real estate. We have a great environment. We're situated in a great location. We can really, if we, if we can knock the bull out of the park here, if we get this tax structure down. We have everything else going for us. The best restaurants in the country. We have tremendous lifestyle here. And just have to get the tax structure under control so we can grow the economy. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's it for our Coffee Talk with me. I'm going to hand it over to Matt, Councilman Dump. Always great to have you on, and I look forward to our next cup of coffee. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Um, you're probably regretting giving me airtime today, uh, so I apologize. It's great. It was great. <laughs> I, I don't have any strong opinions on this stuff, by the way, guys. Um, I'm, I'm kind of milk toast. But anyway, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, keep an eye on your inbox for other stuff coming up. Again, next Thursday, we would love to have you on that webinar, but you got to register in advance. That's the key. Stephanie, great job today. Good to see you. Happy day. And everyone, take care and have an awesome Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much.